it's of course very important that when we design how we run the economy, we think far ahead, not only in our investments, but in the natural resources we use. And for instance, if we cut down lots of forests, then we are leaving less for future generations. And it should be that these items are included as negative quantities in national accounts. And my friend and colleague, Sir Partha Gupta, has indeed written a great deal about this. He's a leading development economist, and he's, I believe, persuaded the government of India to start putting in their national accounts a negative contribution to the GNP if they have reduced natural resources. And that, therefore, allows people to realize that these resources are not inexhaustible and are a capital stock that we need to preserve. And it's very important, I think, in all policy decisions to realize that uh, natural resources are not inexhaustible and some can be lost and depleted by policy decisions and to make sure they are fully taken account of. Of course, uh, biodiversity is a feature of our planet and if it's lost, then of course it harms human beings because we depend on fish and if uh, fish stocks dwindle to extinction, we are damaged. There may be some plants in the rainforest that could be of use to us in developing drugs. But there's something more than that. In, for most people, the variety of life on Earth has value in its own right, quite apart from what it means to us humans. So if the actions of humans on the environment cause massive extinctions, that is something which is not only harmful to us, but we might feel is an ethical wrong. And in fact, the great ecologist E.O. Wilson said that if by despoiling the environment we lead to mass extinctions, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. And I think that's a very deep sentiment. We've got to bear in mind that one feature of CO2 emissions is that uh, the impact which they cause is not limited to the country that emits them, it's spread globally. And indeed, the emissions which come mainly from the developed world, Europe and North America, are going to have their negative consequences, not so much here, where we can cope with them better, as in places like Africa, where there will be droughts and excessive heat, etc. So it's very important to ensure that we think globally and not too parochially. And of course, one of the other consequences is going to be that some parts of the world are going to become less habitable than before. Some will be less fruitful because the monsoons are going to move and regions of drought and rainfall are going to change. Weather patterns will change, will change drastically as CO2 concentrations raise the overall temperature. And so there's a great interest in ensuring that these problems are tackled globally and that we are mindful that the downsides will be felt elsewhere. And of course, if there are massive migrations of people, then we must deal with them humanely. But it's obviously far better if we can avoid the need for them by providing energy in the parts of the world as yet lack it, and also do all we can to prevent the kind of climate change that would motivate extra pressures for mass migrations. Looking at things in long-term perspective, it's clear that technology is advancing, and this is hugely beneficial in many respects. The world, as compared to 20 years ago, has been transformed by information technology. It's wonderful that 600 million people in Africa, at least, have mobile phones, and that many have the internet. It's less wonderful that there are fewer toilets in the world than mobile phones, so there's a long way to go. But technology, if it's widely spread, can be hugely beneficial. But, of course, this does put pressure on the environment and also pressure on energy supplies. And we need to ensure that the way in which we get our energy in the world is of a sustainable nature. And that therefore means moving away from fossil fuels, which are going to have this cumulative effect on the atmosphere and a gradual warming effect on the world superimposed on all the shorter term fluctuations in climate. So it's crucially important that we get the long term planning right 
and also that we ensure that politicians make decisions which don't overlook the long-term consequences of their actions. And I think for many of us, we can be technical optimists, but we can't be political optimists, bearing in mind that politicians often uh, don't react to even the most obvious moral uh, imperatives, like dealing with the world's bottom billion and dealing with migrating people in desperate states, etc. We need to ensure that politicians are sensitized to care about people in the disadvantaged parts of the world. And this can be enhanced, I think, if the churches raise their voices and imply that it's the obligation of the developed world to help with this agenda. Because only if the public in the developed world is behind this will the politicians be encouraged to go ahead. Otherwise, they will succumb to short-term and parochial pressures.